You're listening to the Art of Dying Well podcast, making death and dying something we can all talk about. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Art of Dying Well podcast. Now, I suppose the first thing to say, and this is quite a nice thing for me, I'm actually not on my own. I've spent so long <laughs> rabbiting away to myself, and now I can joyfully say I'm joined by Julie Etchingham. It's Julie, how are you? I'm fine. It's lovely to be in here in a studio with good colleagues and a you know great subject matter to get stuck into. But yeah, I'm finding this more and more bit by bit. We're just sort of getting back to how we like to broadcast, where you can actually look people in the eye and judge things by their body language. It really makes a it's difference. It's different, isn't especially it? Especially on subject matters like this, actually. I yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that human connection that we've all temporarily lost and hopefully got back again. Now, listeners, you might remember that Julie featured on an Art of Dying Well podcast, episode 22, when we were talking about reporting on death and dying, obviously during the pandemic, and and we'd hit that 100,000 mark, hadn't we, at that point? Um, Sadly, it's got worse than that. Now, today, we're going to be tackling, I think, a really interesting topic, uh, not often spoken about, men and grief, quite broad, quite a lot to talk about. I would say that we aren't on our own in the studio as well, Julie, but I'm going to leave that to you. Tell us who we've got and what we're doing. Thanks very much, James. Yeah, well, I'm really, really happy to say alongside me is one of my best broadcasting buddies, Colin Brazier. We worked together a long time ago at Sky News and uh, we used to actually anchor, co-anchor a programme in the afternoons back in the day. So it's really lovely to have Colin with me today mm. to, to talk about this issue of male grief. It's a sad position to be in, but I've three uh, of my friends have lost their wives to breast cancer, um, all of whom had children to at various ages and stages uh, in life that they had to help navigate through their own appalling loss. All have had to find new ways of living as a family, uh, helping their children through clearly the most challenging um, times of their lives. Um, So I'm quite intrigued having these friendships to mine a bit about whether men grieve differently to women. You know, there's no comparison in the depth, obviously, but are the routes that they navigate, the responses they get from friends maybe different? Do they get treated differently as a result? What lessons might Colin Mm. be able to to give us? And just as a, a, a thumbnail sketch, Colin Brazier is an incredible senior foreign correspondent and news anchor for over three decades, uh, recently left Sky News to work for GB News, and he lost his darling wife, Jo, in 2018 to breast cancer. Um, She'd been diagnosed six years earlier and they have six children, Edith, Agnes, Gwendolyn, Catherine, Constance and John Joe. I've got them in the wrong order. (laughs) Um, And I must say, Colin, you know, apart from it just always being just so lovely to see you, you know, Joe's funeral was one of the most beautiful Mm. I've ever been to. Mm. Um, Thank you. And and it, it matters you know, I mean, before we sort of start to talk about your personally, that that moment mattered profoundly, didn't it? Um, and I remember all that your beautiful kids in that front row at the church. It was, it was a, an important marking stage, wasn't it? It really, obviously? really was. It really, and uh, uh, it was important to get it right, actually. Mm. And we and we got it right on the day. And I think about it often. The funeral, actually. Uh, I thought about it recently when I dropped Agnes off at Newcastle Uni. And how we miss ceremony when it's not there. And, you know, time was when people, you know, the father gave away his daughter as she was married. And now I felt like I was giving away my daughter to this institution. And actually not just a university, but actually when they leave at 18, that's kind of it. You, you, the relationship is severed irrevocably to, in, to some degree. That sort of daily contact goes. You see them when they come back on holidays and they maybe move abroad or start work or whatever. It's a different kind of relationship. And I felt then that actually ceremony hadn't kept up at all with the pace of modern developments, and particularly this idea that 50% of kids go to university and we are handing them over, no ceremony. It felt wrong. I wrote about this for The Spectator at the time, and I got a, bit, a little bit of flack. It doesn't matter. In the, you know, when you, mm-hmm. It really doesn't matter, does it? Uh, it was quite soon after Joe died. I think the article was three or four weeks, literally three or four weeks after she died. And I wrote then about the importance of... Um, of formality and ceremony, but particularly around around formality and uh, and funerals getting the state they deserve, death getting the state it deserves. And I got a lot of flack from people. It was debated on the Jeremy Vine programme and, and some papers. And you'd get the other side of the argu- argument, which was, 
you know, if people want helium balloons and, and if we're going to celebrate somebody's life and death and that that's fine and and we were suddenly into this world of sort of i felt moral relativism and 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 i've got one you know really quite conservative view about this from which i cannot be dissuaded but i think you know there are logical merits to it and just to wind this up very briefly when for instance i was arguing for people wearing black at funerals mm. and uh, and there'll, there'll be some people who say come on that's old-fashioned nonsense you don't need to do that sort of thing but actually it does give you a license to behave in a certain way you know go to a good uh, a good irish catholic funeral <laughs> wake and people have had a drink at the end of it and it gives you this license to be lachrymose but it also gives you a license perhaps to to be a little bit drunk and rowdy <laughs> at the end of a wake but people say oh, we understand there's yeah. a there's a black suit there's a black tie we get it give them some space yeah and and I think I sort of I admired you for that actually I have to say and I think you know it's worth stating if it's not <laughs> screamingly obvious that we know we both we're both Catholic um, and I'm I'm a cradle Catholic I was brought up in that tradition you were a, a later convert yeah. um, to, just to, just on to that I'm going to start interrupting I'm going to start interrupting <laughs> my, my prerogative uh, the uh, there's a wonderful book at the moment by Tim Stanley another Catholic convert yeah. and historian you've got that look on your face yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well he talks a lot about the importance of tradition yeah uh, uh, you, and obviously the funeral rites are a massive part of that mm. tradition the punctuation marks and the lives our life stories and actually just to bring this back slightly it puts sorry to jump around a little bit but one of the books that really helped me putting aside tim stanley's book was a book by Catherine Mannix, an oncologist. Uh, yeah. And a great friend of this podcast well, how as well. Yes, I had no yeah. idea, actually. Yeah, she's been very was. involved with this podcast. Well, that's wonderful. Because I, I recommended it to a couple of, uh, of friends. And, and that idea that she, she uh, has, and it's not an original idea, but to hear her express it so eloquently and so rooted in her own experience of the dark comedy of death, but also that sense of limbo and, and the key thing, that parallel with birth. And the ca parallels between um, hospice care and midwifery, and that all felt so true. And having had six children with my dear wife Jo, and you know, in that limbo time when you're waiting for a baby to be born, that limbo time when you're waiting for your spouse to die in a hospice, there were parallels, and she she put it so well. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I know you've you've spoken about this before, Colin, but actually to touch on that hospice experience, to mm. touch on the fact that, you know, very sadly, you know. Joe's diagnosis to her death was six years. Mm. I mean, it, that is a that's a long spell of ups and downs of suffering. But it, I suppose, it allows family life and big family life in your case to to start to regear and readjust. Mm. It ha was it, did it help? I mean, I don't want to sort of put words into your mouth. No, obviously. it did. It, abso it absolutely did. And I, I found myself thinking the other day, did was I mourning for six years? And um, I don't, I don't think so. I think there was, I was probably on the on the spectrum of denial acceptance I was probably a little bit to the to the denial side I took a policy I think we took a policy policy decision early on which was if clearly some things would have to change you know she was she'd been a journalist she was thinking of she took a maths a level oh, uh, yeah. because you know, <laughs> because she, she was worried that her brain was turning to blamange and that also and she could help the kids with their maths and then maybe she'd become a maths teacher and obviously things like becoming a maths teacher well that that clearly couldn't happen in other respects, you know, the, the, there was uh, we decided to carry on pretty much as as if it wasn't happening, and we thought about moving to the Scottish borders at one stage. We were looking at houses, and it was within you know a year or two of her death. I mean, because our policy was we carry on, not as if this isn't happening, but we carry on as if actually the wonder drugs start doing wonderful things and or, you're engaging you know. with life you're, in, you're, you're not, just you're not continuing down. you're just not are you just carrying on and, and i suppose for the kids that's mm. i mean that's just a oh, totally. no-brainer and you it? know you're how just... i feel about this year i hate the whole kind of you know battling against cancer and mm. you know i hate the language uh, i'm sure catherine mannix has got a lot to say on this but you know the the problem with the, a lot of the language is that it presupposes that it's a, it's a battle to lose and somehow you haven't tried hard enough and therefore you've lost the battle no, uh, we, we could do without the hyperbole, but you can do also with a, a philosophy which says, yes, we will carry on until, until we physically can't. Two key questions. I know that Joe was very open, blunt with you and very caring and gentle with the kids about preparing all of you for her death. How did that make a difference to, the, to your grief and how did it make a difference to the kids' grief? I'll start with the kids. Um, 
she 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 died in July 2018. We and I got a call from the oncologist in February, and you know that was the call. You know she's she's dying. You need to prepare. She could have weeks, months. She so she lasted four or five months, and that was the point we sat the kids down and said, "This is now happening," and we the eldest came back from university and we. We had this dreadful moment when you see the look on their face change from delighted to see you to something's not right. I think you can guess what it is. And we sat her in the car and explained. And then the kids came back from school. And I I sort of led that conversation, actually. Um, and uh, so that was that was difficult, obviously. For me, she did the kindest thing that a, that a dying spouse can do. She said, well, she was... <laughs> <laughs> Typically, Joe, so you really will go mad if you're on your own. <laughs> so you need to remarry. You need to find somebody else. And and actually, it, it was a cruel thing to say, very precisely. She said, you haven't got the resources to cope on your own, <laughs> uh, which, you know, there was a bit of me sort of br- bridling and it, thinking, oh, God, you know, you, sure you should have married me because you clearly hold me in fairly low regard. Um, but it was true, actually. And uh, she, no, she knew me better than I knew myself. And... Uh, uh, and I didn't have the resources. I don't have the resources, actually, to cope with my own, certainly not with six children. And um, and she gave me the green light. That's inc- That's What a gift. What a gift to do that. I agree. Because that's a liberation, isn't it? No, it totally is. And I know... And let, let's, get, let's get into this now, preempting your question, but I mean, you know, the, um, you know where... Uh, I'm now with somebody. And... Uh, uh, it, it, you know, that that made a difference. That sense of authorization, that sense of—I mean, it didn't accelerate the process. I don't think particularly, but it, there were amid the many long dark nights of the soul. I didn't have long dark nights of the soul thinking, "Is this morally correct?" No. So we'll we'll maybe talk a bit, bit more about that um, in a moment. But there may be somebody listening to this that has just entered this very dark spell of their lives, where that immediate raw grief which can almost take the chair from beneath you mm, can't it just yeah. if you know with whatever you're comfortable with mm. those early days i mean it's it's hard to fathom really isn't it it is it is it's um it's the veil of tears and 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 you're in it f- i was in it for months from february and you are it's a sort of I felt quite insensate, really. I just felt very disconnected from mm. things. I had lots of practical questions to address. Um, but it was, you know, all the cliches are true. You, it is day by day, take a day at a time. There was also a bit of me that was that was the journalist, perhaps, in a slightly, <laughs> you know, circling pattern above mm. watching from on high uh, this thing unfold anthropologically in front of me and observing strange, strange things. You know, I remember driving back on the, literally the day she died back with a couple of the kids, I think, home from the hospice to sort out some things. And I had this tremendous urge to find on Spotify, um, I think it's Kenny Rogers, the coward of the county. What was all that about? <laughs> what was all that about? And it was this sort of song from childhood. And there was, so there's how bits of you that's how extraordinary. Yeah. So the timelessness of that period, but also the, the absolute vital importance of the support and the... The, the letters in particular, the letters. So I had a, 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 a ritual, and it did become a ritual because she wasn't buried for three, three and a half weeks after her death. So I had, a, I had weeks uh, to sort of process this thing before we then had the, the punctuation mark of the funeral. And I would, it was a really hot summer, July, mm, and particularly hot summer, and, uh, and I would go into the, I've got a sort of pony paddock opposite, and I would go into the pony paddock with this today's sheaf of letters and cards and, and just wail and wail and um, uh, and read and read and wail some more. Um, uh, and that was, that, that was the really intense period, those first, that interregnum between death and, and the mm-hmm. funeral. Mm-hmm. And I can't overstate the importance of, of that funeral ceremony. I felt apt by the end of the funeral, and it was inter- interesting because Joe was a great singer, and, uh, <laughs> and we had the Requiem Mass at my local parish church but she wanted to be buried in the village church in our C of E and because the C, that, that choir was one of the choirs she sang for the, the Reverend Vanessa the, the vicar said fine but wanted to sort of do the orchestrate the, the graveside ceremony herself but I remember getting there and sort of not being being quite underwhelmed by this, the, the C of E 
let it all hang out <laughs> thing. <laughs> but I felt, this shouldn't become denominational, should it? But but I remember feeling absolutely purged at the graveside. I just felt absolutely spent, and uh, and you don't realise there and then that that has performed a useful psychological function, but it really had. Yeah. yeah. Don't skip the funeral, kids. No, it's funny, isn't it? I was talking to some friends um, after a funeral recently, and it's interesting. People quite often say, and I'm sure you've had it said to you as well, you know, oh, you've got a faith; it must help at moments like this. Mm. And I always said, I always pull that sort of face that you just pulled at me, um, <laughs> where I just go, "Well, actually, um, not. It's the, it, sometimes the point at which you feel if you're howling into the void. Sometimes, so, but what the ritual and the ceremony does is give you a handrail in the dark. That's beautifully put." And people. and I think that, you know, at its very least, it's that. And actually, at its very best, it's that as well, in yeah. a way. Um, and I felt that very profoundly at Joe's funeral. And I should say as well, they, you know, played a recording of Joe singing a nightingale sang in Barclay Square at the end when her coffin was taken uh, from the church, which was just... It was extraordinary because she was... You feel very close to someone mm. in, the, in those first days and weeks mm. when you've lost somebody they have a proximity to you that's mm. sometimes hard to express actually isn't it it's really odd well, you're sleeping in your marital bed yeah you're looking at their clothes every time you hear a car on the gravel outside you think it's her car i mean it's it's very odd i felt as the months rolled into years at times the sort of the, the Milan Kundera's unbearable lightness of mm. being that i am essentially quite a shallow person and that you know the, the essence of my being is pretty light but there's no, there's no cheating the subconscious, I've, I've discovered, and this comes back to this sort of journalist hovering above the process slightly. I was really struck by the dreams in the weeks and months that followed, mm. and there were a couple in particular, one in particular, which uh, I can conjure up very vividly still, where, and it was sort of in the sepia black and white thing, and we were, she and I were walking, and it was almost like a vision of heaven, really. We were walking along a beach, and it was night time, but you could still see things in this sort of night vision sepia thing. And off the beach, up away from the sea, were caves and people. And it felt incredibly familiar. It felt incredibly powerful. I've no idea what the lesson was that was being imparted, if there was one, but it felt like a, a message of sorts. Extraordinary. They're very vivid, these sort of experiences in those mm. early days, aren't mm. they? How do you think... Do you no, some months after. Oh, so actually, as, yeah. as long as mm. that. Mm. As long as that. Mm. Who, who did you, whose shoulder did you cry on? I mean, you, you had to get the kids through this. Who did you turn to? And how did people respond to you as a man being in grief? I think that there's a, a cliche is too cruel, but that there's a school of thought that says, you know, men are given a, a not a free pass on this, but they, that, that, and to your point about men grieving, women grieving, that somehow... Women have to; they're expected to keep the show on the road, but somehow the the father somehow gets a, a little more latitude. I wrote a book for the think tank Civitas about uh, twelve years ago, and part of it was speculating on why having a few kids rather than a, an only child or no children, the benefits that accrue to that. And I saw it played out amongst my own children that there there was this critical mass. They were able to occupy themselves. But also, as I said in the book at the time, I mean, the, the rates, for instance, of, and there's not much in it, but there is a demonstrable increase in things like suicide rates in amongst parents who lose an own, their only child. You've got other children that you, you have to keep going for. I mean, this is obvious, isn't it? It's common sense stuff. But I had to get up and make them breakfast in the morning. Some of the drudgery, the horrible domestic drudgery, that was helped. There were, you know, a cup, you know, cleaner, two cleaners at one stage, was taken care of. Um... How did My your sister ma- came down. Your sister, how did your male friends respond to you and help support you? My son's godfather, in fact, both godfathers, one of them had lost his wife soon afterwards to breast cancer and his late wife was Joe's oldest school friend. So there was quite a lot there. But uh, probably the person who took it upon himself to institutionalise the thing, and it was very blokey, you know, he'd call me every couple of days and just say, you know, how are you? And a friend of mine called Ewan, who's lived in Prague for 25 years, went to Ampleforth. And I don't know whether that was a sort of sense of religious, almost a requirement. Mm. We weren't very good at it, the blokes. That's the truth. Um, 
I don't recall a single, and I hope I'm, this may be my defective memory, but I don't recall a single profound conversation, particularly with a male friend, possibly with uh, the, the exception, actually, of a mutual friend of ours, John Holliday, who nearly died of cancer, and maybe that had opened some doors of perception for him. But no, I, we, I wasn't having daily conversations for two or three hours on the phone, weeping. He's, he's, I, I mean, I suspect that's one of the big points of distinction, isn't yeah, it, really? I think so. Is that, I think so. um, you know, my my dear friends who've been bereaved, my female friends who've been bereaved, there's a sort of circle of women that gathers and they sort of gear in and gear out and they're, they're there. It's a very it's a very obvious, you can physically see it around mm. the, the grieving woman, actually. Mm. It's very profound and I suspect it's very, you know, it's a very different thing, often, often for men, not always. The, but. The, the, the crushing thing is the not having somebody to, as you know, any parent knows, the the sort of quotidian challenges of parenting and you, you're constantly triaging and making a series of decisions, really, you know, boring stuff about whose <laughs> sports kit goes to the <laughs> washing machine first or, you know, how do you get them there to that play date and then back time for badminton or whatever it is. Or sometimes it's more profound than that. They're not, you know, this daughter seems to be struggling a little bit, doesn't she? And then you turn and there's nobody there to say, yes, this is what we need to do about it. And, uh, and even things like, you know, I'd just turned 50 and there were probably things that, you know, I mentioned moving to the Scottish borders, there were things that we had in mind that probably involved not working in journalism, for instance, and, and then suddenly, you know, no, whatever plans you individually had, this is all about keeping this show on the road. Yeah. Um, but not being able to talk to your clue. And we, she and I were so, we talked non-stop mm. and, um, and that was suddenly this yawning vacuum. The silence was terrible. In the house, in, yeah. in my bedroom. Yeah. At the end of the day, when the kids are, yeah. are in bed, it's that moment when you, of, of total solitude, isn't mm. it, really? Mm. Yeah. I want to, James is listening very intently alongside um, this. And I, and I was going to ask Colin, mm. really just to touch on the fact there's so much, I mean, we could talk for hours, really, there's so much. You know, spool on these couple of years, three years, via a pandemic, and all, you know, your kids growing up, some going off to university. I mean, from what I've seen with other friends, Grief can jump out of a cupboard. <laughs> yeah, but it's not <laughs> a mental illness. You, it's, no, no. It's not I a think, mental I, illness. Yes, exactly. It's the most it's natural a process. thing in the world. It's a process, yeah. but it's not linear. Having just witnessed friends at close hand, I've just realised that sometimes it can come back. Mm. And I'm, it's gonna, I'm going to disagree gonna... with you. I'm okay. gonna, I'm gonna, I, that, well, that I'll make my... a change. <laughs> 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 that wasn't my experience. My experience was, uh, I can plot the graph. Oh, that's really uh, and, interesting. Uh, and it's, it's slowly degraded. And uh, and I've, I've tried almost little aid memoirs. So every, I, every Friday I try and say a Hail Mary at 9.10 on the moment she died. And just to reinsert myself into that most yeah. profound moment of my life when th this person you know intimately is literally taking their final breath. And, you know, I was there with all the kids on her bed as she, um, she breathed her last. And um, it, it, it's... It, you know, I mean, it just, that helps actually. It helps because uh, if one of the kids is struggling or work's not going so well, or you're struggling to pay the mortgage, none of these things matter when you've been there. So there's a little anchor point. Yeah, absolutely, think. totally. Yeah. yeah. James, do you want to? Oh, it's prof profoundly moving for me, I must say. And, and I have five children, so I'm, I'm relating a lot to mm. this. In my uselessness, I have to say, that's the thing that, that struck me. I'm thinking, if that happened to me, how would I cope? I think I am deficient. I, I can certainly sit here and say, you know, even getting the kids from A to B, even the simple things, I think, I think I'd struggle. I think I'd have real great difficulty with that. And coping with your own grief alongside that strikes me as incredibly difficult. But I, I am, I'm ex extremely moved by what you, you've had to say. Um, how are the children now, do you think? Uh, I think they probably struggle with it more than me. Um, not least because I've met, I, I've met somebody else. I need to sort of spend 30 seconds at least talking mm. about this. So, you know, there, there, there were no close male friends, but I knew a woman who was a friend from before Joe's death. I knew her late husband. He died two months before Joe died. Uh, he was a friend of mine, and, and Joe was a friend of Olivia's, and um, and we were much thrown together at the start. We walked a lot, and over the months it became something else. 
she's got three teenage daughters, so we were in a similar place. And I think that, I mean, this is this is really sensitive stuff that goes without saying, doesn't it? And I think there are two points of real sensitivity, and I'm not here to uh, to sugarcoat things. So, kids want you to preserve. For all you tell them that mummy said it was fine to, for me to meet somebody else, that they're, they're not really fine with it. <laughs> they're not really, really fine with it. Maybe after ten or twenty years, but I'll be dead by then. Uh, well, you know. And I think there's that there's that constant tension there. I think really to some degree it's un- insoluble, mm. actually. And they've said to me, uh, at least one of them has said to me, you know, Dad, you can remarry, you can find another wife. We can't find another mummy. And it's it's as profound as that. But I think in this whole process, I've found myself to be, after that great purge, and I come back to my unbearable lightness of being, I'm afraid. I just, I don't feel... No. What I do feel is that it is possible to fetishize grief. I think sometimes we need to crack on. You know, I remember reading an, an interview with, I think it was Charles Saatchi, somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but who'd lost his wife, and every, and every day he walked to the bottom of his garden, there was a, a, a brook, and, and there was a, st- a big stone boulder marking, the, I think possibly where his wife's ashes were buried, and he would read her a poem every morning. And I remember thinking, you know, m- move on, Surely, surely. But I suppose it, it's, it is it's deeply, deeply personal, personal to it's everybody, deeply personal. isn't it? It's know? so deeply personal. But it's also a conversation that needs needs to be had. I mean, so for instance, you know, you might say, when is the right time to meet somebody else? I mean, you're, mm. you're, you're you know, people listening to this, are, that's the yeah. key question. Well, when and, is and the I, right and time I think to find a, somebody I else? I think it is, a, it is, we have to be really brutally honest, it, when it, it, it's a key question for, for men in grief as well, well I look, think. Well, yeah, look, and, and I come back, I'm trying to sort of knit this together a little bit, but, you know, we talked about the importance of tradition, and in our case, Catholic tradition. So I found useful and helpful a framework that said there's a Catholic tradition that you wear your wedding ring for a year and at the end of the year you take it off, and I took it off and I put it in a safe and thought I'll give that to John when he's going to marry somebody, and that, that felt right. But, you know, respectability has its uses, it's very unfashionable to say that, isn't it? But, you know, we don't want the state or other agencies to legislate on this deeply personal family stuff, do we? We don't want the state to say, he will wait. He will wait five <laughs> years and then you can remarry. So, But, you, but you, you don't want people to feel that they are, uh, you know, an island unto themselves either. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that I would have benefited from, you know, somebody walking down the high street and people tutting at me because they've heard that I'm now in a relationship and it's only nine months after your late wife left. But I think, you know, you, you have to be conscious of that need to be respectable because we, we create respectability by our collective sense of what's right and proper. Really interesting, really interesting. Um, I suppose we, we should probably draw what conclusions we can of this because as you you know we would all acknowledge everybody has their own personal way of dealing uh, with grief when it comes um if there is someone listening that is just in that raw stage what words of comfort what words of guidance would you give them colin but the veil of tears comes to an end it it, it does and um and have something to hold on to. I mean, I don't like that word visualize, but you know, you do do try and visualize something. <laughs> and for me, it was, you know, we were moving into autumn. Um, it felt like the the walls were closing in around me, and I, you know, you, you'd wake up in the morning and it would crush you as the your eyes opened and your brain engaged. You think, oh God, you know. I never couldn't quite get out of bed, but there were days you you felt like not getting out of bed. And I remember, as it went into the winter, just holding on to that vision of watching a cricket match and seeing the green sword and it being a summer's day and the clink of, you know, cutlery on China and just something congenial and happy and relaxed. And um, I remember the moment going to see a cricket match the following summer and just thinking, we, you know, the other side, this is the other side. Yeah, there is a season. Yeah. Well, I'm sure she's smiling with enormous, endless pride, Colin. You know, especially all those beautiful kids who serve you all so brilliantly in being a great reflection of the two of you with all of their ups and downs and energies and mm. the paths that they're carving through life. And it's extraordinary. I'd, I'd say, just I know, you, I know you're trying to wrap up, <laughs> but I'd just say something else. Don't, don't fight anything. Mm. 
if it doesn't feel natural, it's probably not to be done. So I remember, uh, I mean, I, for months and months and months, I would talk to her all the time. I'd be in the car, driving away, I'd talk to her. And then one day I realised I hadn't talked to her for a few days, and then I realised I hadn't talked to her for a few weeks. And, you know, there's a healing chemical in your brain or whatever. This is not a mental illness. It's a process. It's natural. We've got half a billion years of evolution behind us working this out. Colin, thank you. Lovely to see you. Again. You too. The Art of Dying Well podcast is available on Amazon, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and more. Just search on your preferred platform. Well, yes, there you go. We're literally all over the place in the digital sense. So there's no excuse not to join us on our journey to make death and dying something that we can talk about openly and indeed honestly. OK, little pause now for some expressions of gratitude. First of all, of course, a big thank you to Julie Etchingham for taking the reins there so skillfully. And of course, to Colin Brazier. I, I don't know about you, but I found that really, really useful. Searingly honest very moving, and also plenty of tips to help us all plot the graph of grief. What a great phrase that was, as Colin put it. Great stuff. Okay, well, happily, we've got a really full podcast for you today. You know, we've just had Colin Brazier. We've got two more slots left, two brilliant guests. And the next guest is extremely passionate when it comes to empowering men to talk about death and grief. So without further ado, Let's get down to a little... Death chatter. It's just a chat about death. Right, time now on The Art of Dying Well for death chatter. Now, I'm very happy to be joined by an excellent podcaster, we like fellow podcasters, of course, who I came across as a result of my love for Norwich City Football Club. And I'm, I'm sure I could bore you to death on that, so I'll try not to. And that's Chris Reeve. Chris, how are you? I'm well, thank you, James. I'm well. I've just got back from a holiday from Paris, the first time I've been away in in a seemingly a long, long time because of the <laughs> pandemic. So I'm feeling refreshed and 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 ready to go again. Brilliant. I'm ready to take on not the topic of Norwich City, but actually <laughs> you're here to talk to us about death, dying, and grief, particularly obviously from a male perspective, something we share. To give people a bit of background, you're one half of Talk Norwich City. Really good fan podcast. I like it. Incredibly, your co-presenter Jack Reeve is not a relative. I had to sort of Google around that in the early days of tuning into you. Do you get that all the time? Yeah, we we, <laughs> we change our answer each time as well, depending on whether we're feeling mischievous or not. Sometimes we say we're brothers, sometimes we're not, but we've both <laughs> got the same second name. And um, and the whole reason why we came together and Talk Norris City was formed was actually our our shared grief because Jack, the co-host and founder of Talk Norris City, his dad passed away. And of course, I came along and my mum had passed away. So we we actually, I guess, got busy with Talk Not a City and became super close because of grief. So that's why it's always been a subject that I'm very happy to talk about because I know that it helps so many people. And effectively, if I can use the football exposure to impact people, particularly blokes around grief, then for me, that's a massive win. Well, that's music to my ears and, of course, particularly pertinent with this particular podcast. Now, let's go back to 2007 for a second. Obviously a painful time when your mum died. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I believe. How old were you at that stage? I was 14 years old. I always think, oh, it's a bugger, that age. Well, it's a bugger at any age, as I'm sure lots of people will be uh, saying and, and thinking listening to this. But the reason why 14 is a difficult age, in my opinion, is because I was in between seeing things, witnessing things, hearing things, remembering things and not remembering things. So I've got a younger brother, Dan. I'm quite envious of his position because truth be told, he probably doesn't remember much at all because he was much younger than me at the time. Whereas the other end of the stick is sometimes I wish I was maybe four or five years older because then I could remember everything and process it a lot easier. And it's now been, what's my maths here? 13, 14 years. And um, I've been piecing the puzzle back together again, truth be told, James, for all of those years and finding out how people did things, why people did things around all of the icky stuff like wills and money and trust and houses and possessions so yeah 
it was a strange old age, I have to say. And I was particularly moved because I know, of course, you've talked about this on on a few occasions that that are available online. You described your mum as as a hero to you, which I found very moving. And you know, fourteen years is a long time, but for you, it's still her, her sort of heroism burns brightly, doesn't it? And what she meant for you. Yeah, definitely. I think um, people that haven't been impacted by what I would call a close death or a close grievance, someone that's been really close to you in your life, sometimes they hear that and they go, wow, you would say that. But what I would say is I think that that's just a testimony to who she was really. And even at a young age, I'd just absorbed so much of her sparky, vibrant personality, her passion for helping people her jeu de voir, to use a French term, her, her joy of life. And I've really absorbed that. And I'm so grateful for it as well. Special lady and my hero, because the most important thing in life over and above anything else, for me, is philosophy and having good values. Without that baseline of good values, I personally don't believe you can achieve what you want to achieve in life. You'll always come unstuck if you don't have good values. You'll always be stopped at the gate of a career opportunity or a relationship. And so I'm just so blooming grateful that mum from an early age and my dad, you know, really, really helped inject those those values into me. Now, we're talking about men and grief. Obviously, you were a boy then. Um, slightly, slightly different angle and all manner of things are going on in your mind and your body at 14. Even I can remember that casting back a little bit further than you. Do you think, might seem a strange question, but did did you ever get the sense that your mum was kind of more worried about you at the time that she realised that obviously life was going to be drastically shortened? Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. I can't imagine how she felt. I can't imagine it. And again, a maybe a challenging age to leave kids behind at because they're not quite over the line, you know, that 18 or 21 year old line that society puts in place, obviously. But I feel most parents that will resonate to and they'll understand that once they've got to 18, you know, they've had jobs or they've found a little bit of a career or or a niche for them to hone their skills in, they've developed relationships, friends, etc. So I can't imagine how she felt leaving behind kids at that at the age where they hadn't got to that level if that makes sense but yeah no it's uh it's, it's, it's one of those things where i i don't think actually you know what that's something that i've never really spoken about james is actually how how scared she must have been i was i was presented with a letter this is a takeaway for anyone that's actually listening to this that potentially is is close to death i hate to say or is actually just interested in the topic and wants to learn the art of dying well. Writing a letter is so powerful. And the only reason why I know that is that this letter, this letter was rightly or wrongly kept from me for quite a few years from my dad. And it was almost like a bit of a superpower because he'd waited to hold out until he felt I was ready to have it. The letter reads really well as an older person and as you read through the letter it does make you think James oh my god imagine having to write that letter and how scary it must have been but also she did that that's a that's a job that in in a logical sense you think I'm going to do this because it's a it's a good thing to do but from an emotional the emotional side of of things it's worked and if she could hear this now I would say thanks mum because that seriously helped me. So do write a letter if you if you can. It sounds like a gift, actually. You're describing it as a gift, albeit I'm sure when you first read it, a very, very painful one. Your mind must have been all over the place reading it. Yeah, definitely. Particularly because I'd forgotten things, actually, James. I'd forgotten our little in-jokes. I'd forgotten the fact that she used to give me back tickles, for example, when I when she wanted me to relax to go to sleep at night, or she would read to me in bed, and there was always this one story which I used to cry with laughter over. She always used to moan at me to brush my teeth because she worked for Henry Shine, a very successful American dentistry sales business, and uh, she used to moan at me for brushing my teeth all the time. And she just put at the end, "P.S. Don't forget to brush your teeth," <laughs> and. That was just so lovely. So there was a lot of philosophical stuff in it, but actually 
there was her humor in it too. And so reading it was a shock, but I would only describe it as insanely powerful. Now you talk about some wonderful, what I would call almost sort of toolkit items, you know, when you're in this position of of feeling, you know, a, a sort of maelstrom of confusing feelings, I'm sure. And grief changes over time as well. It doesn't necessarily become, although it does become easier in some ways, it can become more, more difficult in others. And you talk about those, you know, forming positive habits and being grateful for things. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. There's only one way of describing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I was dragging through grief like a coal bag of shit for three years, I'd say, at least. And I didn't know where to go and I didn't know who to turn to. And truth be told, no one really knew what to do with me because I was that age. And then my dad said to me, son, you need to just go along to this. I've I've signed you up for this thing called Mindspan. When, oh, dad, I don't, (laughs) come on, you know, I don't want to do that, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, go on, go and do it and sold it into me a little bit. And I went along and I went along with quite a closed mind. And anyway, so, so Mindspan is a, is a psychology, what I would call a psychology training company originally formed in, in Norwich and now works nationally and internationally as well. A guy called Gavin Drake, former footballer, Paul McVeigh is a franchisee as well. And as a young guy, I was in this room full of older people. And I think they were probably quite shocked at the fact that I was in there and it really impacted me in a number of ways, actually. And so my biggest tip of all is to spend time delving into the world of self-psychology and understanding your thoughts, because if, of course you can control your thoughts, you can control your emotions, and, then, and therefore you can control the outcomes that you get, right? So it's that triangle of, of thinking. That's one thing. I really understood from that the value of time. I couldn't really understand why mum had left the planet that early, And then I thought, oh, my God, this really makes sense now, the value of time and being acutely aware of how you're spending it and why you're spending it in that way. And I'm so blessed and so grateful that I'd learned that lesson at the age of what would have been 17 or 18 at the time, because now I just feel so lucky because hopefully I'll I'll live till I'm very old and I've got that in my my arsenal and I'm actually almost really sad for the people that don't learn about self-psychology and the value of time until something hits them later on at say maybe 40 or 50 when you know your grand or granddad would naturally die given given the the average life expectancy in the UK for example so I feel very grateful for that I, I also learned about gratitude and as you can tell because I'm constantly saying uh, how grateful I am for everything but that's true And Gavin gave me this whopper of a tip was just to write down all of the things I'm grateful for. And at first you hear that and you think, that's fluffy nonsense. I don't need to do that. But I did it. And you write down all the little things, James. You write down, um, I've got a computer or I've got a roof over my head or I've got a perfectly serviceable car where I can drive from from A to B. I'm wearing a nice T-shirt or I'm just wearing a T-shirt full stop. All of the memories you've had with that person that is now gone, they're all the things that you can be grateful for. And I don't add to that all the time. And actually, James, to tell the truth, I haven't added to that list for probably about five years now because I've not needed it in a while, which I'm so happy about. But when I've felt really down in really dark places, I've actually got my phone out. I've gone to that note on my notes section and I've just read all of the things that I'm grateful for. And instantly afterwards, it's like a magic trick, honestly. Afterwards, I'm like, God, I've really got it good in life, really. And I think until you, sometimes you have to see it down in black and white, just how good you've got it for you to truly appreciate it. I think if you keep things in your brain, sometimes it's hard to open certain doors. Sometimes you can't see all of the chess pieces in life that that you've got to control. I think it's a very good way of putting it. Now, let, let's get at the nub of, of men here and men dealing with death, men dealing with grief. Because if we were to follow the stereotypes, obviously, probably the biggest stereotype is that men don't deal with feelings that well and emotions that well. And men don't do talking. That would be another one if we were looking at those. Number one, do you think those things are true? And number two, how do we counter that as men? So... I think for any men out there that are comfortable with talking full stop, please don't feel guilty for doing that. And I'm actually saying that to myself as well, because I sometimes feel guilty that I'm 
maybe sharing my, my X Factor sob story, I call it a little bit too much. I call that in my head. I'm like, oh, they've heard this before or, oh, here I go again. I'm talking about grief. But then I think, no, you know what? This is a really blooming important lesson. And actually some of my most switched on closest friends in life have said to me, in fact, it was my friend Matt the other day, he said to me, God, Chris, I'm so pleased that you've shared your story because it now has meant that I have a close relationship with my mum. And I was just like, that's the exact reminder that I needed to to do that. So that's that's one thing regarding being a bloke. And if you're comfortable to share, share. I would say that it's getting better in terms of blokes talking. But I think there's a hell of a lot of work to do, James. And I think it's been slightly accelerated by the conversations around mental health, which is obviously extremely important and is linked to grief, obviously. But I think the topic of grief itself in silo isn't spoken about because people are still very scared about talking about it because they they don't want to come across as sounding down or depressed. They don't want people to feel worried about them. And why is that person talking about this? Why is the person thinking about death? Whereas I flipped it. If someone says to me, Chris, do you know what? Before I die, I want to go to the top of the Eiffel Tower. And I think, you know what? I'm going to help you get to the top of the Eiffel Tower. And until you have those conversations, they're all just buried away. And I think it's insanely powerful to talk about death, but you have to get the people that are comfortable about talking about it, James, they have to lay the railway track down for people to get on it. And at the moment, I still think that not enough people are laying that railway track down to talk about grief specifically, which is the whole reason why I've spoken about it on my podcast, you know, with Simon Thomas, who some people will know, former Sky Sports News presenter who sadly lost his wife. You know, anyone with a with a, a large audience or even a small audience, just talk about it. Just talk about it because it feels it helps you because it lightens your load, but it definitely helps people as well. Well, it's wonderful for you to give that example of somebody that actually said to you, a friend that actually said to you, well, actually, I, I appreciate my mum more. Yeah. You know, I've got this opportunity to appreciate her more and not take her for granted. That's brilliant. And, you know, I keep harping back to the things you've said, but one of the really good phrases, goodness, you should patent this one. I don't know where you got this one from. It's great. Grief is the petrol in my fire every single day. That's strong. I'm not sure if I have. I don't think I've robbed that. I think I think I've I think I've come up with that. I've not heard it put that way before, but that's incredibly passionate about this subject. I can't water that down, James. It is. It's the way I feel about it, genuinely, because I feel like, and I spoke about this before, to put a football analogy on it, I feel like I'm always one nil down. Always one nil down. But fighting back into it. Yeah. The best teams, the most famous teams, the most famous games are the ones when teams come from behind. And I kind of use that analogy in my head sometimes, right? I'm one nil down here, but that's actually really fired me up. And yeah, I would 100% say it time after time and time again, that grief is the fuel to my fire without a shadow of a doubt. It makes me, every day I think about like, what I would do if it was my last day, or what would I want this person to think about me if I left the planet tomorrow? I think about it often and I think it's really helped me spend my time doing things that make me happy rather than wasting this precious time that we have on earth. I just wish I could instill that oomph into people that haven't experienced grief because until you do or you are touched by it, I think naturally you kind of just ignore it. And I think if people could see grief as the fuel to their fire mentally, they could actually really utilize it as a mindset hack to achieve so much more. Do you know what, James? Sometimes I just think, sod it. I'm just going to have a go here because I'm going to die. And I really do think that. I think, oh, well, you know what? Nothing will ever be as bad as mum dying. So that's why I go on camera to thousands of people every week. And people are like, oh, how do you do that, Chris? Are you not nervous? No. Are you scared? No. Being scared is going upstairs to say goodbye to your mum and seeing her lifeless in her bed, that's being scared. And so I think that's why I say it's fuel to my fire. It's really hard to articulate that, James. It really is. But I think it's probably the most 
powerful thing about grief. And if I, I wish I was told that earlier, because I think I've only started saying that and thinking that it's it's fueled to my fire for maybe the last five years. Hmm. It's taken me a good five or six years to get into that headspace. Are you afraid of death? Um, maybe, James, maybe. I'm more afraid of not living my life to the full now. So I wouldn't necessarily say I'm scared of dying. And what I have said in very crude, brash conversations where I'm feeling a bit, maybe a bit confident is I say, well, if I walked out of my house tomorrow and I got hit by a bus, I'd actually be really happy with how I've left it. I only say that now and then when I'm in a really happy place and I'm achieving everything I want to achieve. But when I'm not, it does worry me. But that's what injects me with that energy, that jeu de voir that I've mentioned, that joy of life. I may be a little bit scared of dying, but I'm more scared about the fact that I've not done all of the things that I want to do. But I think that means that I will end up living a more happy, more fulfilled life than people that don't think and talk about death. Do you know what? I've not even given you chapter and verse on the art of dying well, but that's pretty much exactly what we say. You know, you have to live well to die well in many yeah. ways. And the here and now is important. It's important for your death and how, how you die and, and what you leave behind and the things you bring to those around you, which is why I'm, I'm so delighted you, you've come on now. Now, listen, I do want to finish by talking about memory, actually, and remembrance, because November, obviously, is a traditional month for, for memory and remembrance and, mm. and just taking stock of things and thinking about the people that were very important to us. How important do you think it is to just hold up those, those memories, particularly, of course, of your mum? Very important, James. And um, even just you saying that has, has actually triggered me a little bit, to be honest with you, because... Um, Memories are the most important thing. And I'm so blessed and lucky to say that I now have a wife and she's really bought into memories, traveling, going for it and just saying yes more than you say no. And just in line, you know, and linking this back to my mum, and I was reminded of this recently, one of my mum's old friends, I because as I said, I've been trying to piece the, the jigsaw piece together for a while you know who were mum's friends and who got what and where are the photographs and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and I just resigned to the fact and there is a point to this so hang with me I'd resigned to the fact James that I'd only got the photos I'd got and one of the things that really really hurts me and what did hurt me is I couldn't remember my mum's voice and again, that's a, that's a when your mum dies when you're young thing I think I think you could probably remember it if you're a little bit older but anyway, so out of the blue, one of my mum's friends, Sue, contacted me on Facebook and said, oh, Chris, I've, um, I've got some old photos from our holiday in France. And I went, oh, um, that's nice, Sue. Thank you very much. I, I look forward to get, I'll, I'll get those off you. And she was like, I'll give it to you on a memory stick. I'll come and meet you. Oh, and Chris, I have found uh, a video. And I went, pardon? And she went, I found a video. And she went, oh, you but don't get excited because there's no there's no sound on it. And it's mainly of me. And I thought, well, I don't really care because I'd just love to see mum moving again because I've not seen that. I can't remember that either. So I grabbed the memory stick, got home, plugged it into my computer in a hurry. And I said to Becky, I've got some photos. I've got a video, but it's apparently a bit naff. So I plugged it in and I pressed play on my computer. And there was noise. And I'd not heard my mum's voice in 13, 14 years, 12 years, whatever it is. And it hit me like a steam train of grief. And I could barely breathe because I was crying so much. But it was like a shocked happy that I'd never experienced since she died. Like a genuine shocked happy. And this is all linked to memories, James, because the video is us in France. I'm pretending to be a French waiter and my mum loved a glass of wine. So she's speaking to me in French and I'm serving her wine like a waiter and she laughs and we chat and you can see the love in her eyes for me and the love in my eyes for her. And honestly, James, the key part of that is I, I, her laugh. Like I'm going to have to, I'll find the video before I'm fat, I'll find it now. Her laugh was just the most powerful thing. And so my whole closure and action point on this is 
focus on memories, but also document all the time. Take pictures with your parents, take pictures with your friends, take videos, stupid videos, silly videos. If you're, if you're drunk, if you're not, whatever, you know, I very recently had a great idea, which was to interview my grandma and ask her questions. Right. So then we could look back at that and people see that as a bit weird, but I just know through my experience with mum. So I'm going to do something that I've never done before. And I'm going to, I'm going to release this video into the wild because I think it's the right thing to do. So I tell you, I'm very, I'm very moved even listening to you talking about that. Those extremes of it. You must've been sort of simultaneously euphoric and heartbroken. I guess it's those extremes. Absolutely. And that's a very, very accurate way of describing it. I haven't experienced that ever. That feeling of just pure shock and heartbreak and happiness all at the same time. You'll get me getting the tissues out steady. I didn't prepare for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, well, I do apologise. Oh, here you go. I found it. Here it comes. Uh, Somnia. Oh, Excuse me, I'm going to go. I need you to look at the train this morning. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, my God. Anyway, it goes on. Oh, what what a lovely woman. You know, sometimes when someone dies and you go back right to your point, James, at the start, you view your mum as a hero. And I kind of started to doubt that. And I thought, oh, I just I just thought that because, you know, that's what you say when someone dies. They were the best person ever. And when I watched it, I went, I was right. I shouldn't have doubted myself. She was a hero. She was hilarious. She was funny. So that was insanely powerful. So if there's, you know, I guess two things to take away from this, focus on self-psychology, your mindset, appreciating time and thinking about gratitude. And then, and then also, you know, recording memories with people because when you go, they will be like that, that video is saved everywhere as the best video ever. And I've got it saved in about a hundred different places, James, in like every single digital item I have, it's saved. Can't be lost. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, such joy as well. Isn't it funny? Because that's a video where you see life. You see life being lived, yes. literally, and, and a lot of joy. And oh, oh, crikey. I don't know how you've managed if I'm like this. So um, thank you so much for sharing that, particularly with us, on top of all the wisdom. I'm not crying now, James, because I cried <laughs> so much. I cried so much when I watched it about two months ago that I probably cried about two years worth of tears. <laughs> so uh, that that's why it's not hit me today. <laughs> Well, look, this has probably been the most incredible death chatter we've had. I really thank you so much, Chris. Literally, as I say, not just for the wisdom, but for, for sharing candidly these very personal things, because I can really tell you just want it to help people. You want people to just find a path, really. And, and James, and, and, and I'm so pleased you said that, find a path. And I really want to emphasise this. When I was 14... I wish someone had just shown me a path. And what I mean by that is people back off. I'm going to say the opposite. Please don't back off young people that are experiencing grief. Please don't back off anyone that's ex experiencing grief. Give them some options that they can pick, but don't leave them alone to work out themselves because they're not making progress and they're not being proactive in their grief. And I think until you're proactive in your grief by creating that space and time to think and to do all of these things that we've spoken about on this podcast, it's going to take them longer to learn that it's petrol to your fire, if that makes sense. Perfect sense. Chris, thank you so much. Thanks, James. To let us know what you think, follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook using at Art of Dying Well. Or you can check out our website, artofdyingwell.org Yep, you can join the conversation on social media if you're that way inclined, most people are or if you're curious and want to know more about what we actually do at The Art of Dying Well what resources we have, what we make available online head over to our site, artofdyingwell.org and obviously you can contact us that way as well if you like there's a link in the footer, scroll down a bit there Now, do you have a smart speaker, as many do? If so, you know what to ask Alexa or Google or whatever. 
The Art of Dying Well podcast is on Amazon, Audible and Google Podcasts. So ask your smart speaker to play the latest episode. There you go. You can harness the power of AI to make sure you don't miss a single minute of the Art of Dying Well podcast. What a top man Chris Reeve is, I'm sure you'll agree. Grief is the petrol to my fire every single day. As I say, probably should paint that. It's a brilliant phrase. I did, on one occasion there, at least end up reaching for the tissues. Really, really powerful stuff, particularly that portion where Chris talked about memories. And how he felt when, you know, that he'd perhaps forgotten the sound of his mum's voice until the family friend gave him that powerful video clip. Now, I guess really it needs to be seen to do it justice. Not so easy in audio. So what we'll do perhaps is post that on our social channels. So if you want to see that particular clip, Chris holds it up to the camera. Usual drill, search for Art of Dying Well on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we'll post on there. Right now. You've heard two excellent guests, but we're not done yet. After a hiatus of a few months, our reflective, some might say spiritual, slot is back. But we've made a little adjustment to the name. The voice from the bedside chair. Some of you may have heard a slight shift in the naming of this slot. It's now the voice from the bedside chair. Now that's really to enable us to bring you a wider pool of very well-placed guests who know what it's like to be at the bedside. And in the chair today is the magnificent, that's not in my script, I'm adding that, Jim McManus, Professor Jim McManus no less, who's a good friend to the art of dying well, and also the Director of Public Health for Hertfordshire County Council. And can, can we whisper it? President of the uh, Directors of Public Health? Yeah, well, I've done it now. So. As you can imagine, listeners, quite a busy chap over the last 18 months or so uh, with the the rather unprecedented coronavirus and the response to it. Uh, What do I say apart from how are you, Jim? I'm all right, actually. I think there have been times during the pandemic when I wondered if I would be like like lots of people. But yeah, I I think I'm I'm good and and hanging on in there and, and finding bits of light and grace in the midst of all this. Oh, good for you. Yes, much needed, I think. Now, listen, today we are talking about men and how they handle dying, death, grief, different states, of course, on the the journey. And I'm going to start, actually, because interestingly, Colin Brazier, a bit earlier on in this podcast, actually saw the merits in reclaiming some of that stiff upper lip, show must go on type of mentality. And I'm going to ask you, first of all, should we do that? Or as men be more in touch with our emotions? I think it's quite mixed. There, I think there's sometimes benefits to kind of holding it together until you can fall apart, as it were. So when my dad died, he died very suddenly and I never got to say goodbye to him. And as the eldest son and my mum was disabled, I had to do all the work of the funeral. And actually, it's awful. It's a horrendous time. You can't grieve because you're rushing around registering deaths. And it wasn't until after the week when I was doing some washing up that I completely fell apart. I mean, really fell apart, pining and yearning for my dad and felt lost like I'd never felt before in my life, despite losing my gran and granddad, who were like parents to me because they essentially brought me up. So I think it's unhealthy to bottle it up forever, but as a coping mechanism until you can find somewhere safe to fall apart. I think a lot of professionals who work with grief do that. Do you think grief is more likely to ambush men than women, potentially, or is that a bit too simplistic? It does feel like it in the experience of everybody I know, because I think the expectation of masculinity and handling grief is not for all men, but it is often seen as something that is a gender trait that you don't want men to have. But actually, the whole point of male clergy, the whole point of the tenderness of Christ should, I think, bring us back to the idea that men should be in touch with their feelings. And it doesn't matter whether somebody is heterosexual or gay. You know, this is a problem across men. It's not a problem across sexualities. The generalisation that gay men are more in touch with their feelings isn't necessarily true either. Men have a problem in expressing grief. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what can we do about that, do you think? How can we handle grief better? And then I will come on to death and dying as being, you know, obviously before the grieving process. 
I think we have to acknowledge that it's real and actually it's okay to grieve and recognise actually it's hard work. Grieving is, is hard work, whatever you're grieving for. And that it is part and parcel of being human is being able to grieve. And that's a sign of maturity and strength, not a sign of weakness. Now, that's easier said than done. But um, being able to cry in front of people when you're sat in a meeting and you've seen other men cry because it's the first time they've been back in the office in a while or because they've lost a friend, then respecting that and going with it and not trying to stop people who are in there expressing grief, I think, is really key. Now, you've been in many hospitals, many hospices, been on the board of trustees of hospices. I know you know plenty about that. And I know you've been at, at many bedsides. What about men who are dying? Are they, do you think, more prone to denial? Do they struggle to actually take this, you know, massive change in their lives? Do they struggle to take that in their stride, do you think? I remember when I was 15, my granddad sitting in um, the Western Infirmary in Edinburgh and saying to me, when everybody had left the room and I'd given him his pipe and he said, I know I'm dying and none of that lot will tell me. And I just fell apart and we had a really kind of sweet moment. And when he came back in, he said to them, look, I know I'm dying. And the the best deaths of men whose bedsides I've been at are when they know they're dying and they prepare for it, you know, the art of dying well. And when we discuss it, and I think we've got a real problem with that in our society. But I've I've visited people in hospices, I've visited people in hospital, and that kind of recognition has been a kind of moment of, if you like, sweetness and an ability to come to terms with it and be relieved. And I think it takes great quiet inner strength to do that. And it's not the kind of strength that we expect of men. I don't know if I'm making sense. Oh, no, absolutely. But I am going to take you from the bedside chair into the bed, because I know you're okay with me bringing this up. But of course, you've survived cancer as well. There must have been some very difficult times then when you when you look at your life and, and look death in the face, quite literally. How did you feel at the diagnosis stage? Did you think that was it? I did, because when you told you got cancer, everything goes in one ear and out the other. And funnily enough, it was the 4th of December 2012, so it's less than a month at the time of we're doing this, so from the sort of nine-year anniversary, as it were. I took nothing in. I must admit, I thought, well, that's it, I'm going to die. And the doctor said, well, you're going to have to take three or four months of work, and sort of looked at her and went, what? And it was complete shock and denial and just numbness. You know how people say, you know, well, well, you go through all these stages. Well, I went through numbness and shock, back to numbness and shock, straight into kind of grief and then just into depression and then back out of that into determination that when they said to me, look, actually there's a very good chance with this type of cancer will cure you. But it was a very difficult journey because I'm allergic to opiates. So most of my painkilling journey, I couldn't have morphine because it's just awful. And I'd rather have pain than the side effects of morphine. But the chemotherapy is foul. You lose a lot of weight. You're in a, um, because it was a blood cancer, you end up in a, uh, they try and kill your immune system. And you end up in a, in a room where there's nobody around. So you lose your work. You lose your ability of people to visit you without kind of being masked up and gowned in case they give you an infection. When you're neutropenic, uh, your immune system is destroyed. You can't eat anything other than boiled food or stuff that's been so processed it's not worth eating. You lose your appetite and you lose your mobility. And you add to all of that the fact that you think you might die and it becomes a very, very challenging time. And I don't think I've ever been quite so vulnerable in all my life, but funnily enough, that's been a source of strength. But the grief of one's my own potential death was very different from the grief of losing my father. Yeah, that's interesting. So are you saying that you potentially started to grieve for your life while you were still alive? I think I went into what I would call lament. 
you know, that feeling of being forsaken by God, which lasted for a couple of days and I was feeling sorry for myself. And then something happened. I got I got multiple infections and I, I got pneumonia. And I think the doctors were expecting me not to make it because I still remember the registrar coming in and saying, has the palliative care registrar been in? And I went, no, I'm not planning on dying. And it was after I had the sacrament of the sick that, I got this immense sense of peace and I thought, actually, this is not my time to go. And I, and I can't put a finger on it, but I just got a sense of, no, I am going to be okay. And despite huge problems, multiple infections, you know, and, and injections into my spine to stop the cancer spreading to my brain and getting pneumonia and all the usual stuff, actually, I came out the other end of it, admittedly physically damaged and still with some side effects some time later but you just got a sense of once I just gave up and thought well you know I'm going to focus on fighting this and I said to the Lord look you know this is in your hands what do you want and that was when I stopped saying why have you done this and I started to see it as an opportunity and the grief actually eventually did turn into just exhaustion and out of the other end I came out the other end and it turned into something that felt a bit more like resurrection I mean I went into hospital on the first week of Advent and came out or was it the second week of Advent and came out just before Holy Week and somebody said it was the longest Lent you had and I can only make sense of it in those terms but came out of it actually with a, this is going to sound really weird I wouldn't want it to happen again, but I'm glad I experienced that level of pain, vulnerability and fear. Do you understand your life better as a result of that? Yeah, it puts everything in context. It presses the reset button on everything. And I remember saying, you know, to God when it finished, I said, look, right, I'm going to do every bit of good I can for as many people as I can for as long as I can. And the rest is up to you. What a great thing to say. I do have one question, just rewinding a little bit. You know a lot about medicine. You know a lot about healthcare and provision and strategy. You know a lot about nursing and you're a trained psychotherapist. You've got so much knowledge. When you're faced with death yourself, does that all go out the window? Oh, God, yes. I mean, none of your psychology training prepares you for your own mortality. You have to face that. People are really good at coaching other people. They're rubbish at coaching themselves for the most part because you can't stand outside it. You are faced with your absolute vulnerability. But I do think if you haven't had an experience of vulnerability, you can't encounter others quite as well. And I remember in my undergraduate degree, which was divinity at Glasgow, and we had this third year course, which was pastoral care, pastoral psychology, practical theology. It was a very Scottish thing. And we had this... Um, semi-atheist, semi-Jewish consultant psychiatrist from the Southern General Hospital in Glasgow. I mean, you can just picture him. And he, and he sat there one day, he took his glasses off and he looked at all of us and he went, you lot are only here because you need to be needed. And we all sort of sat there and went, ouch, ooh. And you could feel the buttocks clench in the room. It was a challenging moment. And he said, but that's okay, because as long as you recognise that, it won't get in the way of you helping people. And he said, but also remember, you're rubbish at dealing with your own problems. And, you know, you can't heal yourself, you need other people. And it's so true, actually, it doesn't, I mean, you know what's going to happen and you know the stages, but you know it more of a cognitive level than here in the heart. One thing I'd like you to leave our listeners with, as a man who has been through so much, who knows an awful lot about the healthcare system, a very kind, a very charitable man, you've given so much of your time outside of work. And I love what you said about, look, if I survive this, I'm going to help as many people for as long as I can. I think that's what a wonderful way to live. Goodness me in this in this society as it is today. But one message to a man that is either struggling you know, with the spectre of death, or is recently bereaved, what would your message be to help them cope? Reach out and talk to somebody and find 
the strength to be open and honest about how you feel and know that so many other men have gone through similar things to you and will go through them and you're not alone and that it is embarrassment from your friends maybe that stops them talking to you but there are others who will listen please just reach out Jim, what a wonderful way to end, and thank you so much. I will leave you to carry on helping as many people as you can for as long as you can, because you're doing a fine job of it. Well, thank you. It's, it's the first time in a podcast I've laughed and cried in the same period for, for a long time, so I'll blame you for that, James. <laughs> or thank, thank, or thank, thank you. you. Is that, yeah, I don't, I don't know whether I should thank you for that or feel rather, feel rather bad about it. No, but... I'm, I'm grateful for, for that experience. Thank you. It's been lovely. And I am too. Thank you, Jim. Professor Jim McManus, Director of Public Health for Hertfordshire County Council and newly elected President of the Association of Directors of Public Health. Top man, Jim. A guy that works incredibly hard. I I can say that from personal experience. So I'm absolutely chuffed he gave us some time to discuss men and grief, not to mention sharing his own candid reflections on surviving cancer. Well, that is an absolute whopper of a podcast. So thank you so much for listening, for investing the time. I hope you found a few useful nuggets of wisdom and advice there from the three men interviewed. I'm sure you have. I certainly have way more than a few. Thanks to news anchor Colin Brazier and of course, fellow frontline broadcast journalist and presenter Julie Etchingham for providing the insightful questions. Respect and gratitude as well to Chris Reeve for really opening up about his grief journey that started at the tender age of 14 when he lost his mum to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And huge thanks once again to Professor Jim McManus for providing the voice from the bedside chair. Right, we'll be back early in 2022 as early as January, I believe, with another Art of Dying Well podcast. But in the meantime, please do stay safe through these winter months and do know that you're not alone. I say that a lot, but it's it's true. And I'm going to pinch a quote from Julie Etchingham. We're here to provide the handrail in the darkness whenever you need us. Bye for now. <laughs>